like to quote something to you folks that will probably uh, clear up some confusion to those who were able to believe it and receive it. Uh, as we go to the book of Hebrews, the uh, 12th chapter. And therefore, starting first verse, we having with us such an enormous cloud of witnesses throwing off all weight and uh, seductive sin, let us run uh, persistently uh, through our prescribed course, looking forward to Yahshua, the leader and trainer of our faith, who is striving for the reward com uh, prepared for him, endured the cross, despising the shame, and sits by right on the throne of God. He sits by right there, not on the right hand of God, but as God. He was perfect man. He was perfect God. But let's go back and keep in mind why all of these orders were received and brought here from where? From the Pleiades? From this throne? From the house? The morning star? Is it really a great giant space station with 12 floors? Imagine something... Uh, I don't know if you have ever driven across Arizona and New Mexico uh, where you get up on one of those high rises and you look down through the desert valley and through the great monuments. And I always think of that song, On a Clear Day, You Can See Forever. Now what if your eyes were so good that you could see across a table or a level of a floor? in the middle of a great space station. As referred to this mysterious, gigantic thing that is spoken of in Psalm 68. Now we just read uh, where John went up into this high place, translated mountain, went into this high place with Yahshua, and there he was introduced uh, to Elijah, a man who had never seen death because of his courage because of his obedience. And Moses, it's doubtful as to whether he ever really died. Yes, I know there'll be those that say, well, the adversary uh, contended with Michael as over the body of Moses. Now, a lot of people have said through the centuries that this was talking about the incorporate uh, body of his law giving and so forth. But we will not contend in the faith and let us remind you here, let's go back, let's use Daniel here, and speaking of under his feet, and we told you before that Yahshua says that in the Father's house there are many mansions, what we just read to you. And he said, who's going to build me a house? Are you kidding me? Uh, do you think you're going to make me out to be a genie in a Coke bottle that you can take the stopper out and let me float over your little churchy meeting uh, for 45 minutes on the weekend before you go over to Widow Brown's to eat her fried chicken? Huh. What utter nonsense when he said the earth is his footstool. Now the prophet Daniel, he confirms this. The coming order of events is recorded what he beheld in a, a vision because I told you that uh, the book of Revelations and the book of Daniel, they sort of go hand in glove here and they both have these uh, allegories, they have the types, they have the shadows, and we can learn by the symbolism. And Daniel here uh, says in the 7th chapter 13 to 14, I saw in the night vision, in other words, what I saw in the night, behold, one like unto the Son of Man came with the clouds of heaven and came to the Ancient of Days, and they brought him near before him, and there he was given dominion and glory and a kingdom, and all the people and the nations and the languages would serve him, and his dominion is an everlasting dominion that shall not pass away, and his kingdom that which shall not be destroyed. When I talk to all these people that are worried about doom and gloom, and oh, Jesus, don't give back. I'm going to die. And then there are the other fraidy cats that go to the rapture, and I hope that the rapture don't rupture. But we're going to prove I don't find that anywhere in the Bible. That is a, a, free, a prefabricated lie that was used even 
uh, back in the dark ages where the uh, churches, all you got to do is read Fox's Book of Martyrs, and it talks about the tens of hundreds of thousands of people that were all persecuted and murdered and tortured uh, to death in the name of Jesus Christ, uh, just like a good old King James and a whole lot of other uh, reprobates. In the name of Jesus Christ, uh, they killed all of these different people. So back then, the, the rapture theory was going on. But what is it that makes these little to-be-raptured honeys that put these stupid stickers on their car and say, case of rapture, this car will be unmanned. It will crash headlong into you and your sinful family's car and kill you while you're out on a Sunday drive if this rapture happens then. Because I'm going to be with the Lord to sit down at the great marriage supper and have a fight attack for the seven years of trial and tribulations while the devil is giving you hell until all of those Jews over there repent. And then we have 144,000 uh, uh, Jewish Billy Grimms that's going to sing the Hallelujah Chorus and do Pentecostal calisthenics and go out and heal all of you Gentile sinners. Who glory, hallelujah. Uh, I'm going to tell you something. Hey, some of this nonsense, it is really laughable. And I mean to the point that it's sickening. What makes us any better than the countless without end people? They figure in the neighborhood of 60 to 70 million uh, uh, saints Christian people who were murdered uh, in the Ukraine and the Slavic nations and throughout all of these different captive nations that constitutes the United States of the Soviet Republic. And are you going to tell me all of those uh, uh, the estimates from 250,000 to 500,000 people? We're talking about little innocent children and little girls and mothers of those children uh, who were taught uh, that they would disobey, uh, that they were to obey their husbands. They were to obey the state. They were to obey the Fuhrer. And don't tell me that people, uh, then did not still worship in the Lutheran religion and the Catholic religion and the Protestant religion. And don't tell me those people didn't believe in Jesus Christ, uh, when they were wearing the belt buckles that said, Unt mit Gott. Why was it that those people in that beautiful town of Dresden, that the brave American planes and the British planes and the French and the Russian, and they went in there and they bombed those people. And when they took those that were still surviving, they took them out onto the uh, banks of what is the Rhine River, I believe, that runs through there. And then uh, uh, the English and the French and all, they went and strafed them while they laid on the river banks there. It was a hospital town. There was hardly a gun in the whole town. Why were those people not raptured? And why in the world are these rapture people today uh, that sit around and don't fight against this uh, abortion of a million and a half uh, murdered of our... Uh, this. Uh, uh, genocide against our children. Why? We got to think, folks. Now, here we go back. We understand here that the dominion that was given to Yahshua the Messiah, the Son of Man, it consists of a sovereign power, a supreme authority. And it should be carefully noted here that every description of the Almighty here, the Savior, the Messiah, and His glory in the Scriptures mention His feet. For this is the symbol, or the symbolism of his jurisdiction, his authority, describing what is going to take place in the kingdom age, as we find the prophet Isaiah declared, For the nations and the kingdom that will not serve thee shall perish. Yea, these nations shall be utterly wasted, and the glory of Lebanon shall come unto thee, the fir tree, the pine tree, the box, to beautify the place of thy sanctuary, and I will make the place of my feet glorious, Isaiah 60, 12 and 13. Now we find that the Smith and Goodspeed translation, uh, it indicates the relationship between uh, the place of his feet and the footstool. For the nations and the kingdom uh, will not, that will not serve you will perish, utterly 
uh, waste these nations, be laid. The glory of Lebanon shall come to you, the cypress, the pine, and the larch together to glorify it. <coughs> the place of my sanctuary, that I may do honor unto my footstool. All right, so the footstool, we know where that is. We're talking about this planet. Forgive me. Where's the throne? Boy, you don't know how many people I have made mad at me telling them where the throne is. It's there in the book over and over and over and over and over. But... We have these cavemen people running around here with degrees. I believe they have degrees in idiocy because you try to show them a scientific reality and a truth. And then we find the prophet Jeremiah, he shows that the earth is the Almighty's footstool. Now, how hath the Lord covered the daughter of Zion with a cloud in His anger and cast Him down from heaven to the earth? the beauty of Israel and remembered not his footstool and the days of his anger. Lamentations 2.1 Hmm. Think about that. With a cloud in his anger. Someone's brought here in a cloud. Let me read that again. Keep that in mind. Think. How hath the Lord covered the daughter of Zion with a cloud in his anger, and cast down from heaven unto earth the beauty of Israel, and remembered not his footstool in the day of his anger. Now, we find that the very fact here that we're talking about the Almighty, he has a throne in heaven, and the earth is his uh, footstool. This is also emphatically confirmed by another witness, another prophet, Isaiah. No, I'm not getting off the subject of revelations. Because, hey, all through this first chapter, he tells you over and over where this is coming from, from the very throne room, from the very mouth of the Eternal through his mighty messenger uh, to the man John, not Peter, in Rome. I don't believe Peter was ever in Rome. But no, he talked to John to write unto the churches and show the people of a future date and age the type and the shadows and the allegories and why the uh, Semitic Adamic man has had to suffer because of his sinful stupidity and will not learn or pay heed to the eternal. And why have we had these butcher and butchery and the endless losing wars? Now let's go back. Allow me to quote Isaiah 66 and 1. It talks, uh, that's a chapter that talks about the great spaceships of the Almighty. Uh, now for those that say that these lying preachers that tell you can eat pork and all this other pussy food that you're warned against eating in Leviticus and Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy means the second telling. You read that in uh, Isaiah 66. He said, I'll destroy the people who eat the swine's flesh and the other abominable brews. But let's go back. Isaiah 66 and 1. Thus saith the Lord, The heaven is my throne, and the earth is my footstool. Where's the house that ye build unto me? Where is the place of my rest? Big super question mark. Where is the place of my rest? <laughs> now, if you want to get back, and we've done quite a bit of study, We've shown hundreds of places and hundreds of positive proof that this place is very real. The apocryphal writings told of it. The lost books of the Bible told about it. The Old Testament tells about it. The 14 books of the Apocrypha tell about it. The New Testament tells about it. The book of Revelation is telling you about it. Now Exodus 19 and 20. And the Lord came down upon Mount Sinai on the top of the mount, and the Lord called on Moses up to the top of the mount, and Moses went up. But also in the same chapter, it tells you how he got up. Not like Cecil B. DeMille's climbing slippery rocks and bringing down a tombstone under each arm while it's thundering and lightning and raining. Torrential rains? No. He said, Moses, do you remember how I brought you unto myself safely? As on, as on, like 
Uh, here's an example. Like on an eagle's wing. Something that flew that brought him safely there. Now let's take notes of the parable that's given in the 11th chapter of the book of Revelation. We're going to get into this, but allow me to jump ahead where it speaks of the two witnesses who symbolically represent you, these spirit-filled people, the men and the women, the daughters of the offspring, uh, the offspring, the very overcomers who give their testimony to the power of the Word and to the Spirit and the termination of this period in the testimony that's uh, marked out by a very spectacular climax that we're going to uh, prove to you and we're going to show you who these two witnesses are. Oh boy, this has caused more contradiction uh, in the Scriptures throughout all of the centuries. And so John talks about those who are called uh, that uh, John was to told to write down a special message for the attention of this specific group of Christians and this was certified as a specific guaranteed of truth. And he saith unto me, Right, blessed are they which are called unto the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he saith unto me, These are the true sayings of God. I've jumped way ahead to Revelations 19 and 9. I'm giving you something to shoot for. I'm talking about a time in the here and now and this time period it's the belief beyond a shadow of a doubt. I believe this with all of my heart that if you're alive now and alive to 2007, you will see this and you'll either be a part of it or somebody's going to be shoveling dirt in your face. Now it's stated here that they called and it's made clear from the previous quoted statement that we made here and from the 11th chapter of Revelation that the witnesses, the overcomers, they're called to come up hither Come up, come up. The Almighty invites you there. He sends a cloud limo for you. We've discussed this in other chapters, so we won't beat, beat it to death. But isn't this exciting? He sends a limo to bring you to come up because, friends, where the Eternal is and His house, and you're given an invitation. I'm sorry, we don't have anything as of yet that will fly there and take very many people. Now, so come up hither. This gives added emphasis to the exhortations of our friend Peter here. Therefore, the rather brethren, give diligence to make your calling and your election sure. For if you do these things, you shall not fall. Uh, for so an entrance uh, shall be ministered unto you abundantly unto the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and our Savior Jesus Christ. You find it Second Peter 1, verses 10 to 11. And it's talking about, well, I'm on it. Okay, allow me to run amuck here for just a little bit and to encourage you why you should go on and you should know these things and you should understand it. He talks about giving to the overcomers what is to occur at the marriage supper. We don't find much in Scripture to give direction to our thinking of this fascinating, fast, uh, fantastic, mind-boggling topic but in the 17th chapter of John's Gospel, we find that Yahshua's gracious petition to the Father uh, for special favors for us. The Word spake Jesus and lifted up His eyes to heaven. And He said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify Thy Son that Thy Son may also glorify Thee. And now, O Father, glorify Thou me with Thyself and with the glory which I had with Thee before the world was. John 17, 1 and 5 now, if you want something to give you a better understanding of that and show that it is possibly applicable to you, I would take you back uh, to Jeremiah, and I believe it's in the very first chapter, and where uh, the Almighty says, Jeremiah, where were you, boy, before I formed thee in thy mother's belly? And Jeremiah, in essence, says, Thou knowest. He said, Jeremiah, you were with me before the world was. You want some mind-boggling, uh, thought-provoking uh, Scripture? Go back to Proverbs, the 8th chapter. He talks, I believe, beyond a shadow of a doubt that you, the Adamic saints, the Santos, the believing offspring of you who, like Job describes you, you who came forth in the bosom of the Father and the womb of the morning that came out of the Kala, talking about coming out of the very life container that was brought here, 
And so go back and read where Job was and he was told of, of former things and Proverbs uh, tells about uh, you were with me before the world was. You were there with me before the dust of the earth were made. So you were pre preplanned, predestined, uh, preordained. You were sanctified. You were justified. And can't you understand that you were glorified? And he said, if I be for you, who can be against you? Uh, he said that you were there with me when I made the mountains. And he said, when I made the land, and I gave the orders unto the sea that they were not to encompass the land. And then we go back and we tell you about these books that have been rejected uh, by these preachers and these teachers because they can't understand what they got. And so a little at a time they shovel all of these uh, prophetic books aside like the one I'm hoping to reproduce now that is called, uh, it's one of the <clears throat> erroneously labeled uh, uh, The Lost Books of Ezra. It comes from a uh, pre-rabbinical period. It comes from about 100 B.C. It's a fabulous book and it talks about this paradise. It talks about this Eden. It talks about the throne, the house of the eternal and this Eden. All these people for years and all these preachers try to tell us that it was here on earth and all this took place on earth. Hogwash. Because in there, it makes it quite clear. He said, I made Eden on the third day. That's age eon or time period. He said, I made it before or before I made the earth. All right. We'll come back down to earth. And we go back and where Yahshua went on to mention those who He said He claimed for His own. And I pray for them. I pray not for the world, the cosmos, see this world order, but for them which Thou hast given Me, for they are Mine. John 17.9 So we find in His final petition where Yahshua prayed, Father, I will that Thou also whom Thou hast given Me be with Me where I am that they may behold My glory which Thou hast given Me. Uh, John 17 and 24, the answer to this prayer enabled our Savior later to say, I appointed unto you a kingdom as My Father's appointed unto Me that you may eat and drink at My table in My kingdom and sit upon the thrones judging the twelve tribes of Israel. Luke 22, 29 to 30. And so, my friends, if you could only think beyond this realm, and a lot of people are going to say, here he's talking uh, to his twelve disciples, and I believe that may be so. But, but, did you ever think, and I say this not in vanity for you or for myself or anybody else, because let the Almighty, like he said, I will put every man in his place and he shall be satisfied. I'm not so vain, egotistical, and self-centered that I think that I am one of his special little honeys and have a right to go live in the throne room with him. I guess I will if he chooses. He knows best. I have never really become acquainted with my real self. Because the predominance of my life, my outer man, my earthly, conscious, carnal self has never been obedient, oh well, maybe on very, very rare occasion did my carnal self bow down to my spiritual self. Or should I say the soulish self becoming uh, obedient to the spiritual self. Because he tells us that which you can see, that's not real. That which you cannot see, that is real. And that it's just like a beautiful diamond or like, shall we say, a Ramba Hedrick, that it is a, it's a great mystery. And I'll leave you to ponder that as we go on. But we find that the saints of the Most High, the whole point is here that they're going to possess this kingdom as it's promised forever and ever and ever. And here's these clowns that tell us that the earth is so polluted and it's so this and that. And this one's just going to whoosh! It's going to pass away. What have they got in mind that uh, like a balloon that someone pokes a hole in or, or the string comes off of it and all the air goes on and it just goes whoosh, 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 whoosh off into space and all of a sudden uh, here's a new earth, shazam. Here's a whole new atmosphere, shazam. Another magic trick. Well, how do you get uh, uh, transferred from the whoosh, 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 whoosh balloon onto this new one? 
And why? Why would He want to save a lot of us? Well, but the saints of the Most High says they shall take the kingdom and they'll possess the kingdom forever, even forever and ever. And judgment was given to the saints of the Most High. And the time came when the saints would possess the kingdom. And the kingdom and the dominion and the greatness of the kingdom under the whole heaven shall be given to the people of the saints of the Most High whose kingdom is an everlasting kingdom. And all dominions shall serve and obey Him. This is what the great prophet of God, Daniel, said in the 7th chapter and the 18th verse and also 22 and 27. We could do a great, great, fantastic study there. And later on when we're, we're going to get into the uh, uh, revelations here, we're going to find some things. I want to jump ahead so I don't bore you with the old things in the chronological order. Uh, we're going to talk later on about the great chain that's in the hand of a great angel that represents the power and the might of the kingdom of the eternal as it functions and perfection as specially schooled rulers. Are you one of those? Is this what we're doing here? And special schooled rulers that is mentioned in the study of Daniel as the righteous ones among the holy ones who are here to inherit our rulership in the kingdom and in the uh, to be the recipients and all the rewards that are promised to the overcomers. Uh, these are chosen from the, among the saints of the Most High who Daniel has this to say, the saints of the Most High shall take the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever and ever and judgment shall be given to the saints of the Most High and the time came when the saints possessed the kingdom. Daniel 7:18:22. And so we see the character and the reign of our Savior and the restored kingdom of the eternal as described in the 19th chapter of Revelation where he goes on again. And why do we bring this up? What did we just say? We took you back into uh, uh, Matthew and uh, the books of the New Testament here and we spoke of this sword uh, that is again mentioned in Revelation 19.15 and out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword uh, uh, that with it he shall smite the nations who shall rule him with the rod of iron. And so also I believe that this is talking about he whose mouth that gives the orders to some of us that will bring us safe to safety and life and eternal hope and salvation. Uh, and the Greek word from the word satorius, drawn to a place of safety while these others, uh, when he speaks that word, it's going to go out of his mouth as a death knell. It's a pronouncement of uh, death and execution and the final judgment upon this great Babylonian whore that rides upon the beast of the, uh, the political. And so the great chain, therefore, is identified uh, that is uh, ruling or speaking of the rod of iron that, uh, that it will rule at... Uh, uh, of those that are set upon the throne as John saw them, judgment was given to them. I will jump way ahead of Revelations 20 and 4. To them he promised, He that overcomes and keeps my works to the end, to him will I give power over the nations. He shall rule them with a rod of iron. And isn't this just exactly what he said right here? Revelations 2, 26 to 27. And so we find under the unrestricted administration of the law of the eternal that this Satan, he, meaning he who commits treason against the eternal uh, government of the Almighty is effectively fettered and he's put into what is allegorically uh, spoken of as a bottomless pit. In other words, the bottomless pit is uh, referring to uh, uh, a religion that's referring to don denominationalism that's referring to uh, that which is diametrically opposed to the truth of the Almighty as the north is to the south and uh, so allegorically here the pit will be closed and sealed and the binding up of these satanic powers are they have to proceed the ushering in of what people call the millennium, millennial rule uh, for it is stated those who are qualified for rulership uh, having offered up their lives for their faith, that uh, they lived and they reigned with Christ a thousand years. Now this is way ahead there in Revelations 20 and 4. So you might be thinking about this as we progress uh, through this 
interesting book of Revelation? Are you willing to go that far to lay your old neck on the chopping block and say, yes, Father, even if it means laying down my life, you better pray that He gives you the intestinal fortitude. He said, those that hold fast to the end, you are my disciples indeed. So let us think and consider and contemplate the glory of the Almighty that His reign of righteousness is going to be established within the kingdom nations prior to the commencement of the millennial and is clearly indicated by the prophet Isaiah who declares at that time the glory of the Almighty shall rise upon His people and this world will still be in gross darkness. For behold, the darkness shall cover the earth and gross darkness the people but the Lord shall rise upon thee and His glory shall be seen upon thee. Isaiah 60 and 2. The prophet Ezekiel enlarges and enumerates this and takes it a little farther. And he said, The earth shine with His glory. And Ezekiel 43 and 2. That this glory shall be seen by all the people confirmed by the Almighty who declared through the prophet Isaiah, It shall come that I will gather all nations and all tongues and they, will, uh, they shall come and see my glory. Isaiah 66 and 18. That's a great, glorious, mighty, powerful, overcoming chapter. So we're going to find that all men and women and nations throughout the world that are turned to the, the Most High and the Millennial Rule, and it will become universal over this whole world. And I don't care what these people say about this new world order. Don't you worry about the world order. But you better worry about whether you're on the right side and whether you're going to be involved in or have a place in in this new world order. Only because He lived, we live and have hope and we can look forward to the day of the resurrection that will become the greatest reunion of all time through any century and any recorded time in any history, past, present, or future that has passed before us and we will see because of the coming resurrection we'll be reunited with the living together. We rejoice with Yahshua and could say unto John is on the island Patmos, Lo, he said, I am he that lives and was dead. I'm alive forevermore. Amen. I got all the keys uh, to hell and to death. Uh, we already covered that. Revelation 1 and 18, we said it was the most glorious, the most fantastic statement that was ever made. But I think it bears repeating because it involves you and I. And if this is not true, then sucker your worm bait and you're never going to get up. Now Hosea, the prophet, he prophesied of this saying of the ransom that would rescue the, uh, men from the grave and I will ransom them from the power of the grave and I will redeem them uh, from death. O death, I will be thy plagues. O grave, uh, I will be thy destruction. Hosea 13 and 14. And Yahshua the Messiah, he paid that ransom anticipating his mission. Yahshua said unto the Jews who were seeking to destroy him because of his work. He says, and John, the fifth chapter, 25, 29. Verily I say unto you, the hour is coming, and now is when the dead shall hear the voice of the Son of God, and they shall hear Him and will live. Marvel not at this, for the hour is coming uh, in which uh, all that are in the grave shall hear His voice, and they shall come forth. And they that have done good unto the resurrection of life, and they that have done evil unto the resurrection of damnation. So remember this. Let me quote you a little something lovely here from 1 Corinthians 3.19. For the wisdom of this world is foolishness with God. For it is written that He taketh the wise in their own craftiness. So just very briefly, allow me to sum it up here. So you see the allegory once again that uh, we find John, explanations given to him in John 1.20, that the seven stars are angels. Now remember that there's angels over angels, as I said earlier, uh, where we go back for confirmation of this. But first of all, uh, so the seven stars here are representing angels. And I believe that there's a lot more to that than we uh, teachers and so forth have ever seen. Where did these angels come from? Uh, did they come from the morning star? Did they come from Orion? Did they come from the Pleiades? Now there's angels above angels. <clears throat> you remember that I told you about Daniel and this angel that came to him. He said, I heard you pray the first time. And apparently the Almighty had dispatched him. He said, I'd have been here sooner, 
But he said, I got to contending with this angel of Persia. We spoke of this before. But then who saved his buns? It seems that Michael came along and got his old biscuits out of the fire, so to speak. Now, <clears throat> so it seems that down through, a lot of people are not aware of it, through all these ages and time periods, uh, I know that today that we're so disgusted with organized religion, but all through the ages, the predominance, the biggest part of these churches in their beginning, in their conception, they were very, very good. But then we're told in the first chapter, uh, or what is it, the second chapter? Yeah. All right, we're going to get to that here in just a minute. It talks about, I know thy work and thy tribulation and your labor and the patience and how you canst bear them which are evil. Uh, thou hast tried them which say they're apostles and are not, and you found uh, them liars. That's Revelations 2, 2. And so we see here Michael. Uh, this has caused a lot of consternation to people. Uh, uh, he's called, Michael has been described as a champion of God. Uh, he's also been described as he who is like God. And I have run into very many people who believe in actuality that Michael was God and he was another name. Just like the Almighty Yahweh has uh, quite a number of names that he's described by, uh, we have the name like he, uh, Elohim in Proverbs 18 and 10, just one place. And Yahweh, is he's pro, uh, even in your King James, Isaiah 42 and 8. And then uh, uh, we have Yah, uh, Y-A-H, in Psalms 135 and 13. And we have where he's just described as El in Jeremiah 33, 2. Uh, in Eloha. Uh, in uh, John 5:43, and Elion in Exodus, I think it was 3:15, and then uh, Shaddai in Ephesians 3:15, and all these different names are all describing uh, the tenderness and the goodness and the merciful and the uh, all of the different descriptive terms that are glorifying the eternal. But still, it's speaking of the same person. But uh, uh, so much of that. Let's see here. I want to turn over and share something with you here in the fourth chapter of Zechariah. What a lot of people fail to understand here that the... Uh, now, we, we explain what the angels, that they represented the stars. Now, what are the lampstands? We find that most everything in the New Testament... Uh, has its origin, its allegory, its understanding. You have to know the Old Testament. I'm sorry about these New Testament Christians, those who have deceived you. The hour is very dark. You may be one of those foolish virgins. Uh, maybe it's too late for you to get oil in your lamp to catch up. Maybe it's too late for you to polish it uh, so you can make it through the midnight hour. Uh, there's a time coming that it's going to get so heavy duty here. People are going to be so concerned and so devoted and so inspired and so on track on the eternal, so busy fighting for survival that these people who I have them every day calling me and they're taking up my time and they're all writing to me and they're calling and on the phone they're writing. They want answers. They want exact times and dates. Whoever told them that I was a prophet? Did I ever say that I was? But you see, are these the foolish virgins that are going to steal my oil, the brightness of my lamp that I'm trying to clean up? If I share it with them, I may not have uh, go far enough and get enough oil for me to make it through the dark. Uh, excuse me for being selfish. All right, so let's go back so that we might better understand this thing of the lampstand. So we go back to the fourth chapter of Zechariah. Oh, this is one of my favorite chapters. You know, when we talked about the... Uh, well, I don't want to be too repetitious for all of uh, these people who have gone to listen to hours and hours and hours of our tapes that, where we went back and we explained this, uh, where it's talking about, well, like in the fifth chapter. It's the only place in the whole Bible that talks about two women angels or extraterrestrial messengers if you're reading a Friar Fenton, and they're a sorry couple of heifers. 
because I'm going to tell you something. If an extraterrestrial personage shows up to you and she's a woman, I'd be a little nervous. But anyway, let's go back. I don't want to get off on a tangent here. The fourth chapter, we're investigating. We're going to try to understand what does this lamp stand? And the angel talked with me, uh, Zechariah 4.1, uh, spoke with me, and he came again. He walked with me as a man that's waking out of his sleep. And he said unto me, What seest thou? And I said, I looked, and I behold a candlestick, all of gold, and a bowl upon the top of it, and it has seven lamps thereon, and seven pipes to the seven lamps which are up on the top thereof. Now, and two olive trees by it, one on the right side of the bowl, one on the other side, upon the left side thereof. So I answered, and I spoke the angel that talked with me, saying, What are these, my Lord? And the angel that talked with me answered and said unto me, Knowest thou not what these be? And I said, No, my Lord. Now, before we continue on, let's look back for just a moment and try to understand when all of this was going on. And let's take and, and refer to that time period so we better uh, know and understand the situation and the context and the light that it was in and where were they and were they surrounded by all of these heathen people. And these were people that were coming uh, back out of uh, captivity uh, that had been in bondage in Babylon. They were coming with a great mixed multitude. As we um, examine the situation here, what we have is the testimony of a little handful of people that have come back from the Babylonian captivity to, reju uh, re uh, to uh, Jerusalem, not only to rebuild it, but they were to be, uh, rebuild a city and the temple. And uh, uh, we remember the priests Ezra and Nehemiah. They were among these exiles, as they're called. Also, Zechariah, he was... Uh, prophesying at this time. But the main man who was the political and the great military uh, ruler that was among them was Zerubbabel. He directed the building uh, according to the angel of Yahweh that reminded him, kept him in his egotistical place that he wouldn't get out of control. And he passed on, he says, not by might, but by my spirit, say the Yahweh of hosts, you remember, except the Lord keep of the city, it tells us the watchman, he watches in vain, and it doesn't matter about the armies or the weapons you got, uh, for if the Heavenly Father Yahweh, if He's leading and guiding you and guarding you, that's fine. If not, you're not going to survive. Not by my, but He tells, and uh, back here He's warning Jeremiah, but by my spirit. Now we... Uh, left off here in uh, uh, four six, and he answered me. Said, "This is the word of the Lord unto Zerubbabel, saying, Not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. Who art thou, O great mountain, before Zerubbabel, that thou shalt become a plain? In other words, all these governments, he shall blow you down, I'll level you out, and he shall bring forth the headstones there was shouting, crying, grace, grace unto it." And he goes on to say, Moreover, the word of the Almighty came unto me, saying, The hands of Zerubbabel have laid the foundation of this house, and his hands shall also finish it. And thou shalt know that the Lord of hosts has sent me. Uh, for who have despised the day of the small things? And they shall rejoice. They shall see the plummet of the hand of Zerubbabel. And these seven, which run to and fro, uh, and these seven, they are the eyes of the Lord which run to and fro over the whole earth. Now, you know, I suspect and I believe beyond a shadow of a doubt that he's talking about uh, later on. We can connect it back to Daniel. Get your concordance out. You've heard me speak of before. He's speaking of the watchers. The watchers. In other words, a lot of people misunderstand and think that this is just watchmen on the wall, but it's God's watchers that spoke to Daniel, as I quoted in past tapes, uh, where in Daniel they spoke to him and they said, look, we're anxious to be off to patrol the whole earth. And they go out to patrol the universe. They are the eyes of the eternal here. And so then he said, and I answered, I said unto them, 
What are these two olive trees upon the right side of the candlestick and upon the left side thereof? And I answered again, I said unto him, uh, What be these two olive branches uh, which uh, through the two uh, golden olive pipes empty the golden oil out of themselves? And he answered me, said, Knowest not? Thou not what these be? And I said, No, my Lord. He said unto me, These... say rather I cut you off rather short on the last tape. Let me go through it again. I've chosen to name this one the Seven Extraterrestrials. Now I know that again I'm going to lose some more people, but uh, that, that's too bad. If they're so narrow-minded, they won't at least hear me out. But I think that most people who are listening to this tape, I'm not too concerned. But uh, let me repeat myself. Uh, I have told people in times past that the word angel is a Greek word. And so automatically we have a mindset of this real pretty angel. You can't tell whether it's a man or a woman, long hair, big wing, uh, wings on it, and they're seeing the little boy and girl as they go across this swinging uh, bridge and all these other things that uh, we conjure up these esoteric uh, religious fantasies that have been taught to us uh, a lot of times sublimably since we were children. But I have questioned a lot of religious people. They're full of religion. And I say, now let me ask you a question. You believe in angels? Yes, the Bible says so. And I said, now are angels from this world? No, they're from heaven. And I say, well, does heaven mean somewhere in outer space? We don't have time on this tape to go into all of the diversities of the different implications and the different mindsets and ideas that would just give you mental indigestion. But allow me, as I see it, as we still dwell on, and I want to drive the point home here in case you put the last tape aside, the revelation is from this triune, mysterious, heavenly Father that we call God, uh, whom He is, who was, and who's to come. He's the absolute one. He's the Alpha, the Omega, the beginning, the end. He's the Word made flesh. Uh, he's the lily of the valley. He's the bright and morning star. He's the one who said he doesn't change. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And he has no dependence on time or place. Uh, and the, the present and the past and the future, they're all one to him. Uh, the same eternal now who is and who was and who is to be, even the infant, incomprehensible, unapproachable Father of light uh, from whom comes every good gift and every perfect gift uh, with whom there is neither variables nor the least shadow of turning. Now, this was an idea that I added to, and some of it I took from this uh, Seiss, who was a great biblical scholar. Now, uh, the great I am, I am that I am, and so many people have uh, misquoted that, the eternal, unchangeable God of the uh, uh, universe, as we find in verse 4 and 5, and he goes on and he talks about, and he tells us here, we'll see, that he speaks of the seven spirits which are before the throne. Now, a lot of people get terribly confused uh, when later on uh, you'll find Revelations uh, gets into a very climatic era there where it talks about all of the saints, the santos, the believing offspring of the eternal almighty ever-living Yahweh God, they're crying out under the throne. And you go ask one of these preachers, what does that mean, under the throne? And they're going to be all aghast if you try to tell them that this is a very real geographical location which you could walk out of a morning and see. 
talk about get bent out of shape. But then what are they going to do when it talks about the seven spirits which are before the throne? And it talks about the Holy Spirit and the full completeness of His office and His powers are sent forth from the illumination and the cover, uh, comfort and the edification of all the subjects of the eternal Yahweh, God's redeeming grace. Seven is the number of dispensational fullness and perfection. And he tries to show us a great mystery here, the seven churches, uh, which actually constitute and they make up one church, the seven spirits of the eternal, uh, make the completeness of the one glorious and great, gracious administration of the Holy Spirit, uh, such as mentioned in Isaiah 11, 2 and 3. But you see, a lot of people, uh, they get all bent out of shape when you come to this Elohim, uh, which has many, many different applications. It means the Lord's, it's plural for God, they say, uh, but also like Fenton and some of these other scriptures, they point out it's speaking of great extraterrestrial dignitaries. Uh, Try to envision the eternal as the point, the very head, the top of the pyramid like the old C&I. Now, I'm not uh, going to go off on any tangents here, but then he has administrators under him and administrators under those we find in the Old Testament where he talks, he says, put uh, captains over tens of thousands, captains over thousands, captains over hundreds, captains over tens. So you see that there is all of these different uh, places and positions to be fulfilled like Daniel tried to tell them all glories aren't the same glory. There's the glory of the sun, the moon, the stars, and in all of these different illuminaries. And it points to the fact that those who are faithful and bring many to righteousness, understanding of the law and keeping the commandments forever of the eternal. No, no, I did not say that was going to save you. And you know everybody's talking about salvation of their soul and getting their spirit saved. But what about getting your hide saved? Let's be honest. That's what most of us are uh, uh, particularly concerned with while we are trapped in this carnality at the present time uh, because we're full of... I get calls every day. People are full of doom and gloom and fear, and they say, my goodness, what in the world is going on? What is going to happen to us next? And so this is why we're trying to establish these things, and I'm trying to uh, show a chronological order of this. Now, from time to time, uh, we will be just a little bit uh, repetitious here because this is for our admonition. This is for our learning. All right, let's go back uh, uh, to uh, what times are we talking about? You go back to what is termed uh, 39... 96 a.m., uh, and on the other side of that coin, uh, uh, B.C. or before Christ would be three or four years because a lot of people realize that there is uh, some grave error in our determination as to the time of the birth of one that's called Jesus Christ. Uh, a lot of the ancient scholars and scholars even of our century, back in the Dark Ages too, believe that October the 4th or 5th, four years B.C., uh, the temple of uh, uh, Janus, J-A-N-U-S, at Rome was closed this year and open only in time of war. And they're pinning the period down uh, to this Herod that was in power that he was 68 years old. And so we jump ahead another year, uh, 39.97 a.m. Uh, brings us up to... Uh, two to three years prior to the set time they say that Christ was born. And we find these mysterious wise men that come to uh, Jerusalem that I have said in other tapes. And uh, I don't care what the Masonic Order says and a lot of these other cults have to say. Uh, nobody has ever proven and documented uh, to my satisfaction as to where these strange men came from, these kings. It said that they came from the east. Now, I know your King James said they followed a star, but that's not what it said in the original language. It said they followed a great light. 
Uh, and I would ask you, is there a possibility they came from light ships from planets light years away? Well, now hold on a minute. The Eternal said when he comes back, he said, I am bringing uh, my saints with me. I will collect them from the four corners of heaven or the universe. Anyway, so we find back in that year they came to Jerusalem. They were seeking this Yahshua. And we know and we're pointing down the time. This is when Herod, he slew the children after Joseph and Mary had already fled into Egypt. You say, why is this so important? Now bear with me. I'm going to show you that it is very important so that I will be, prove, be able to prove to you and to the skeptic beyond the shadow of a doubt that this uh, book of Revelation, it's a prophecy ahead of time. It was covering the times of Yahshua and his uh, uh, execution, his resurrection, and the time period that John spent on Patmos. Uh, and it covered a period of 60, 70 years right then and there of history. And, and then it goes on and it tells things clear into our day. Uh, stop and think about those people. Say, well, we're not in Bible times anymore, brother. And I say, well, when did we get out of them? Would you give me the exact date? I would like to hear it. Well, glory. <laughs> now, we go on uh, the years uh, 9, 10 A.D. Uh, uh, Let's see, around that would be considered, what, 4,008 a.m. and then A.D. 9 and uh, 10. Uh, we find that Yahshua, at the age of 12, he went in, he disputed with the doctors in the temple, and we find that uh, around, uh, uh, oh, 26, 27. Now we're talking about these years before uh, the death of Christ the Messiah. And we saw, uh, we cover also the ministry of John the Baptist. And then from 27 uh, to 28, uh, we find the baptism around January 8th, uh, 28 A.D., as it's entitled by most of the scholars, the beginning of the ministry of uh, Jesus the Christ. This was the 70th uh, post-exile uh, sabbatic year. I won't uh, take the time to go into all the great detail here because we're just covering in generalities. And so we got 28 and 29, the year of the crucifixion. And then uh, uh, when we get up uh, into the period where we come here to uh, Revelations, round 2, uh, the second chapter, 1 to 7, uh, we find that he's speaking of a scattering of the early church around 30 A.D. to 64 A.D. And we find uh, uh, this will be covering the uh, Church of Ephesus period uh, that's also mentioned in the uh, same chapter. Now, to get to the point where I was talking or, or speaking earlier of the seven angels, the seven messengers, uh, sent and implied from the very throne of the Eternal, now, if you doubt this, we're going to cover this in a little bit. We're going to go back to the uh, book of Daniel. I believe that uh, Daniel had been praying in this great, mighty, awesome. There's all different types of angels that come to you uh, or come to the prophets of old. I imagine if they were coming to you, you certainly wouldn't be needing these states. But... Uh, uh, Daniel at one time, he had been praying quite fervently. He was a great man of God. I think we could learn by his example that he took a lot of time out of his day, in fact, three times a day, and spent several hours a day uh, praying uh, or on his knobby knees or whatever in communication with the Eternal. And uh, he got, so in the amount of time when he wasn't praying, he really got some things done. And you remember the uh, one uh, great extraterrestrial angel told Daniel, in other words, so many words, he said, I want to apologize. Uh, who was it? He said, I was contending with an uh, angel of Persia or whatever. I'd have been here sooner. So we still have not really caught on to, like later on, mentioned in the New Testament, this great extraterrestrial warfare. 
that is going on in the heavens. Now, not only have we got problems here, and I don't want to take something out of context, but we've all heard the Scripture quoted over and over, we fight not against flesh and blood, uh, uh, but against principalities and powers and darkness and high places. Now, was it talking about high places such as Washington, D.C. or Moscow, or is there a contending in a, shall we say, another dimension, a realm that is beyond the sight of us little mortal ants that are crawling around on this ball? Well, there's a lot to think about, and so uh, let's go back here and, and see uh, these extraterrestrial messengers, these angels that were given special duties and jobs to watch over this, uh, uh, these seven churches. Now, you remember in Asia and throughout the world there, there was many, many uh, churches that were converted to and following the Messiah uh, this uh, new stage of the old faith now called Christianity, uh, meaning like Christ followers. And there were seven, uh, typical seven successive stages here that also uh, show the stage of church history and the outline the time of John right up to the second advent and the King James Version. Here we have an address uh, by the various angels which are addressing the church and from the modern uh, versions and the old Fenton and many others. We have the word messenger, as I say, which is much better. Now we find the seven churches, uh, uh, one of Ephesus. Now a lot of people in all my dates, there'll be those that'll argue with me. Now uh, uh, some people believe that it was from around A.D. 56 to approximately 96 A.D. And so I'm not going to argue with the uh, with anybody about these times. Uh, so what's to be gained by it? So I'm flexible. So we find unto the angel or the messenger at the church of Ephesus, write these things, uh, say he that walks in the midst of the seven candlesticks. Now, as we said, and I applied upon the other tape, uh, you go back and you read Job. Uh, there was a man in the land of Luz, is what the Friar Fenton. Now, the word land is from Erat, meaning that land, that globe, that world. Not like your King James, uh, uh, the land of us or whatever it was. That's where we get Alice in Wonderland and Toto. Or are we in Kansas? Now, that's the trouble with the silly little... Uh, mortal men that we are walking in shoe leather, uh, trapped here, held captive uh, till we learn a terrible, horrible lesson, but we can't seem to look beyond ourselves and imagine how big and how great and what a great panoramic view we should be taking of this almighty God that we do praise. In fact, you go back and you uh, read from the book of Job how he was... Uh, a question by the Eternal uh, when he said, you know, what about the Pleiades and what about O Orion and who can break the chains of it? And, and Job, man, he was just mystified. He said, oh boy, I, you know, and, and uh, those of you that have listened to our other tapes, we've looked up many places where it talked about Abraham walked with God. It was talking about uh, flying, going great distances, having personal interviews with our heavenly Father, the Father of all creation. But a lot of people have trouble with that, so I'll just let that go. And so uh, people say, well, what's the Ephesus? I say, well, it, it has a meaning. It means to let go or relax from effort. Uh, although commanded, uh, commended uh, for some very good points to the church, a lot of good deeds, they're doing a lot of good things. But warning was needed. So, you see, here we go. I don't want to be crass. I don't want to make light of this. But, you see, Christ hadn't even left the earth. Real good, so to speak. Here were, uh, uh, you know, several generations who had seen and heard of these awesome, mighty, powerful things that he had done. It's just like uh, me talking to the young kids of today, and I tell them I was alive at the time of the bombing of Pearl Harbor. 
and I can remember when we first heard it, how frightening and all. Even though I was a little kid in short pants, and I knew other men that were older than me that were in the military, and in my family we had friends uh, who were sunk and died there, and, and it's something uh, that you never forget. And, and it's not stopped being talked about. But here, Christ hadn't even gone home. And already it says that they were becoming relaxed. Uh, they had slipped from any real effort. Now allow me to go on. I know your works and your labor and your patience and you, uh, how you've tried them who say that they're apostles and not, uh, and are not. Now we find that Yahshua here, uh, we find that uh, he or his spirit or however he does it, he walks among the churches, he gives encouragement, uh, where warned, showing that he is alive and he's still active and he's still the head of this church. Like I said in many other places, Christ is the head of the church as, as man is the head of woman. But he goes on, nevertheless, you have left your first love, and I will remove your candlestick unless you repent. Although we find the church here, they started off well, but they were starting to relax, uh, and its attitude uh, uh, had slipped somewhat. And they needed to repent, meaning a change of attitude. And there, verse 5, he said, unless you repent. And we're talking now from Revelations 2, uh, 1 to 7. And he goes on, he said to them, uh, who overcomes, I will give to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. In other words, there's a reward, a reward to those who are able to overcome, uh, who remain faithful as to their first love and to the ministry of Christ and his church. Now, before we go on with Ephesus, I, I feel that there's uh, so much else that we're leaving out so many more gaps that we have got to fill. Yes, I really am getting way ahead of myself because um, this church at Ephesus, we're going to get into that uh, where I believe that many people who have commented on this church at Ephesus, I think that uh, Christ was very uh, long-suffering, the eternal, I think he was very mild. Uh, I believe that civilization back then was very lucky that I wasn't the Almighty because I would have mashed the button on him. You know, the Scripture tells us there is nothing new under the sun. No, not one. We're going to go back to Ephesus. We're going to uh, go to the time of Paul. And a lot of people... Uh, today, uh, people are frightened by not only America's economy, and they talk about Russia's economy. Russia does not have any economy. Uh, Russia uh, went bankrupt in 76. But I'll bet you 999 people out of 1,000 or 10,000, they're not even aware of that. I said, all you have to do is go to the library and look it up in the congressional uh, records. Nobody uh, wants the Russian ruple. They can't buy any goods with it. This is why now at this particular period that they're blackballing and blackmailing us. And so we see all of these uh, world international bankers, these super gigantic loan sharks, are manipulating all of this till... They get total power of the world to uh, reinstitute Babylon or to raise up Babylon again. That we find that uh, they're not going to be successful because there's uh, too many contenders jockeying for possession to become the head uh, of this one world government. But anyway, here we are. We're off running on a tangent. But we're going to go into detail here a little bit. And you'll find that this church at Ephesus, we're talking about money lenders like Christ drove out. We're talking about uh, a setup here that was something of a magnitude 
that most people are not aware of what was going on, that these were great money lenders. So we would have you notice here. See, the Messiah, Yahshua, the Christ, he wasn't going to all of the different churches here. Uh, he picked out these seven churches as example out of all the rest because there was a lot of others. But he used these as examples of what we should not be. Now, remember, uh, uh, as, as we read here and we find that there is no churches, no two churches that are alike, he is giving us, so to speak, uh, several different examples. Remember our key to Revelations is that it's written in symbols. So a symbol is not what it says it is, but it alludes to something else. It is not literal as to what it is stated to be, but it refers to something else. And we'll see here in, in, in just a minute how we refer back to the Bible. We use it uh, to prove itself as always being a representative of something else. Now, these seven uh, churches here, they re represent the development of the Christian faith, or a lot of people like to say the church, as it progresses through all of the different centuries here. And we'll see as we progress on towards the end of the age, or this period, the end of the road here, where so many of us find ourselves standing, uh, in a very precarious hour or moment in time. And we look back here and we see that these seven periods, let me drive this home, uh, is pointing to the development of us and our progenitors and what we should be and what we should not be. So for a lot of people that might think our analogy is off the wall, all of this is not a new idea. There's a lot of this information that was contained in writing uh, proving the same point that we make that all this has been around since around the 3rd century B.C. So all we have to do to look around for a little confirmation. And we turn in our Bibles back to Hebrews, the 4th chapter. Uh, I believe it explains it quite more clearly than... Uh, what we can. Now, the point back here that we were making in the... Uh, let's, let's see. Let me turn back to Revelations here for just a second. We're in the first chapter, and it talks about in the 16th verse, and it speaks, uh, and he had in his right hand seven stars. He pointed out of his mouth. Out of his mouth went a two-edged sword, and his countenance was as the sun shining in his strength. Well, let, let's handle the sword part first. So we go back here to Hebrews 4 and 12. For the word of the Father, God, is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and the marrow. Uh, it is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. So, dear friends, oh my God. Uh, you know there's a scripture, just this moment come to me, that, that, that scares me. It said that we will have to account someday for every idle word that we make. My God. I've got an aircraft carrier full of those. And so, in other words, what he's saying, there is nothing in your heart or your cell or the fabric or the fiber of your very being that the Eternal is not aware of as you're going on in the testing ground here. Verse 13, Neither is there any creature that is not manifest in his sight, and all things are naked and open unto the eyes of him with whom we have to do. Verse 14, Seeing then that we have a great high priest that has passed into the heavens, outer space, Yahshua, the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession. In other words, our professing 
that he is the eternal Yahweh incarnate and him we're trusting in. Uh, for the verse 15, For we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. Therefore, let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Now, let me remind you once again, and don't forget, where is this throne? The Almighty, when He refers to something, He means it. Let's go back here, and when He talks about, it talks about His countenance. Let's go back to verse uh, 14. Here's a thought that comes to my mind. Uh, you take it for what it is. But he said he had eyes as of flames of fire. Do you know anybody that uh, does any welding or cutting with a cutting torch or settling torch? He knows when he has a perfect tip on it, it's blue. His eyes were as flames of fire, so believe me. <laughs> well, take it for what you like. But as he just, we just read there, nothing escapes him. And he said his countenance was as the sun shining in his strength. He's talking about something that is shining, something that is like the sun. Those of you who have heard my other tapes that the ancient writers, when they spoke of Venus, the same Venus that Christ associates himself with Revelation 22, 16. Uh, that's the throne he's talking about. John, as we get on here, he said he visited the throne. He described it. He described doors into it and, and doors that go out of it. And a place that had 12 floors, or he referred to it as 12 foundations. Now, uh, Venus in ancient times and the Babylonians, even these heathen nations, wrote about a time when it was so very close to this earth that it was brighter than the sun. He's talking about a house. He's talking about a throne where truth and light exist allegorically, uh, physically, spiritually, every way, shape, and form. As we see later on, he said they had no need of the light or the sun or the moon in it. He's talking about in the holy city. So you see, well, a lot of this seems to be a great mystery in all of these centuries. Nobody seems to be able to uh, understand it. It's simply because our progenitors have not done their homework, my dear friend. Uh, what we should do, uh, we should take note here, first of all, where he talked about we've understood the parable, the idiom, the etymology. We've let the Bible interpret itself as pertaining to the two-edged sword and what it means. Now let us turn back where he talks about, and his countenance was as the sun shining in his strength. Now, folks, we could fill up a whole album on that. Each little line, sometimes one word, is so power-packed as we pointed out. The first letter in the ancient Hebrew alphabet Aleph, it can mean one, it can mean 1,000, it can represent Taurus, the bull, it represents the beginning, and we could go on, but let us turn back for some confirmation, uh, turn to uh, uh, Matthew, the 17th chapter, and starting with the first verse, and it says, after six days. Yahshua, the Messiah here, he taketh Peter and James and John, his brother, bringing them unto a high mountain apart. Now, for a lot of folks who don't understand that, we've shown in our past tapes back in the Old Testament where it's talking about a mountain. It means a place very high up. And I want to point out to you that before a lot of this ever got into English, it's been through close to eight other languages, and so do you think maybe something got lost along the way, especially with the superstition and the fear of the Mother Church and the power 
And if you wanted to get along, you better go along. But so much for that. So he took them somewhere. Now listen. Verse 2, And was transfigured before them. And his face did shine as the sun, and his raiment was as white as the light. Now isn't that an odd statement? His raiment was as white as the light. You go back to the tomb. Do you remember what the Savior, the risen, glorious, overcoming Savior, he said to his earthly mother? He said, Do not touch me, for I have not fully risen. He's talking about uh, transfigured here. Uh, it could be also, at that time, it was talking about a metamorphosis. I think in the preceding tapes, uh, we went in and we, uh, we talked about all of this light and energy, and so we won't be repetitious there. But then he goes back and he gives you another example, uh, which it talks about Moses, and it's even mentioned in the New Testament, and I have never, ever heard any of these preachers uh, mess with this. Only thing they brought it out, uh, they tried to use how his face got all bright and shiny uh, because, oh golly, they were dumb enough and they went back and they read the law and we know that Christ dying on the cross this did away with the law uh, when it's contradictory to what Yahshua said in the Greek. He said, I've come to fully teach. Uh, where it's translated in English, to uh, fulfill the law. Originally the intent there was to fully teach. And he said, I have not come to change one jot nor one tittle, and I don't want to get off on a tangent on the law, but I would remind those who might be sitting in on this, who would ridicule anybody, I'll give you a very stern warning. Whoever teaches the least of my little one's heir concerning the law shall be called the least in the kingdom of God. And so I would advise you to get something besides just the King James uh, perversion because the translators have perverted it. And I would challenge you to get out a Strong's Concordance. And if you need uh, some material that will help you, somebody who's an expert in it, I can refer you to another man who uh, he and his wife are devoting their life to the research and study and promoting and teaching of the law. No, the law alone cannot save us. We know that what we're speaking of here, what Christ did. But, all right, back to verse 3. And behold, there appeared unto them Moses and Elijah talking with him. Do you remember, even the New Testament refers to it. I won't quote all the Scripture. But Moses came uh, back down off the mount, the great mount ships, uh, We've spent endless tapes on this and given you all of the different references and the concordances and uh, different uh, uh, books that give us insight into the ancient idioms and the parables and the, and the language. And we have quite well proven our point that they went up in a great mount ship, the same one that landed in Exodus, and they were to put a perimeter around it and they're told in that one chapter three times that they were to go down and wash, wash their bodies, wash their clothes, do not go in unto your wives. And everybody who's even would come near that, I uh, say, oh, this is all religious ritual. Oh, no, 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 no. That doesn't make the Almighty grin. It's something that these extraterrestrial lords of space under the command of the Eternal do, told them to do for their own sake. Then we turn to the fourth verse of uh, uh, Matthew 17 here, and then answered Peter and said unto Yahshua, Lord, is it good for us to be here? If thou wilt, uh, let us make here three tabernacles. Now he's talking about after they came back from the trip. How did they know that this was Elijah? How did they know that it was Moses? Now think about this. Later on, uh, we're going to cover this, and the Bible talks about those that have a right to the tree of life. 
And so evidently, uh, you see, the church world and the organized religion uh, and those would-be religious and would-be experts, uh, and when I was younger, I was caught up in that thing, ar arguing and contending over the fact that Moses really died. Or was he translated, transformed uh, like Elijah? And so, you see, they're still thinking carnal in the fourth verse, and they want to come down. They said, uh, uh, we will build three tabernacles, one for thee, one for Moses, one for Elijah. The fifth verse, while he yet spoke, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them. Something light, something bright, something that has energy. Go back and listen to the, uh, the tape in this chapter where we covered all of this. I actually have a lot of different pictures in my professions, not that uh, possession, not that I went out and snapped them, uh, but uh, pictures that have been taken in England and different parts of the world, and it shows these light ships that are so fast and so brilliant and so big, they appear uh, uh, on film as just a big cloud of bright light going by or landing. And behold, a voice came out of the cloud saying, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. Hear ye him. And boy, this has caused a lot of consternation and people arguing that, you see, they, we all want to limit and we have our own vision of God and what he should look like and what he should uh, be and he can't have any dualities. He can't take uh, different forms. This is why he's God. Because you don't understand him and I don't understand him. And when the disciples heard it, they fell on their face and they were sore afraid. And Yahshua came and touched them and said, Arise and be not afraid. And when they lifted up their eyes, they saw no man. They only saw Yahshua. And so as they came down from the mountain, Yahshua charged them, saying, Tell this vision to no man until the Son of Man be risen from the dead. Now, uh, I would have you keep this in mind. As those of you that are familiar with our other tapes, uh, where we showed you beyond the shadow of a doubt, uh, using the evidence and the ancient language from the Bible, and tell you step by step where to look, proving that there was these great light ships, or great, any, whatever you want to call them, eagle ships, you want to call them mount ships. You want to call them cloud ships, carubs, uh, carubiums, uh, seraphiums, and cherubims, and uh, all different types. Down through the ages, uh, also called, it's in your Bible, get the concordance out, uh, you know, like the pots of heaven. They talk about the bottles of heaven. They talk about the lamps of heaven. Uh, the all of these different names, everything uh, today. I'll tell you what, when you go along with these people who will not open their minds and try to step into a higher realm of understanding so that they might bring more intelligent people back into the eternal fold, uh, they want to use all of this uh, mysticism and hocus-pocus and say that's spiritual and you can't understand it because you're just a carnal old sinner. Well, I tell you, I'm very sorry, but that is hogwash. It will not wash, as they say. Now, so uh, we go back and we're talking about this Yahshua, the Messiah, that was received by the Father, and he received the uh, throne of his forefather David. I believe we covered this earlier. Uh, uh, not only by right of lineal descent, but as a direct gift from the Father. Now we find here in the book of the Revelation the progressive rewards that be given to the overcomer, and as listed, it is stated there be an, that we, you and I, we're talking about, will be given power over the nations and shall rule them with a rod of iron, followed by this explanation, even as I, re I was, even as I received of my Father, Revelation. Uh, 2, 26, 27. Forgive me. I'm getting a little ahead of myself. I'm going to have to backtrack in a little bit here. But further, it said that the, the Almighty said to John, to him that overcometh, I will grant to sit with me in my throne, 
sit with me in my throne. Hey, will you forgive me? All I want to know is where is it? Sit with me in my throne. It's not talking about just all of us uh, playing musical chairs and see who can grab a, a, a seat with a throne. It's not even like a couch where just a few of us get set down with him. Uh, but it's symbolic. It's talking about his house. It's talking about his throne. It's talking about the fortress, the high tower, the winter palace, the house of pleasure, the house of the heights. It's the very same one as Yahshua used. Not they say, well, it's a Greek word. No, it is not. Paradise is not Greek. It was stolen from the ancient Persians. And paradise, uh, it means the garden as Eden, uh, where he talks about the trees of, the houses of, belonging to the headquarters of Eden. And why are we bringing all of this up? Because. This is what makes it so dull because it has been left out. And if people could only understand from where and what authority and what great height and all of the trouble that was uh, taken to bring this down to low the carnal, sweaty, stinky, grubby earthmen in all of our carnality so that we might overcome. And he said, he that overcomes I will grant to sit with me in my throne even as I overcome and have sat down with my Father in his throne. Now that's Revelation 3, 21. Forgive me, I'm getting ahead. But David, now he was completely aware that this would have come to pass and he proclaimed it in the 110th Psalm. The Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou on my right hand until I have made uh, thine enemies my footstool. Psalms 110.